It is October 25th, and if you have been following Pastor Jack Hibbs at all, he has put out a call to church pastors in light of uh, being uh, October 25th to assemble, to gather together. If your church is closed, and like, I know I'm, I'm kind of preaching to the choir here because we've been open for a while now, but uh, if there's any pastor that stumbles upon this, like on Facebook, I, I truly believe that there is a call to you to uh, open your church because right now and in this time, in this discouraging season, in this crazy season, um, the the world needs the gospel more than ever. And there's a lot of bad news. It needs the good news of Jesus Christ, that he's come. He's given us victory over sin and death through his blood and his sacrifice. And we need to be proclaiming that message day in and day out as his church. Uh, Hebrews 10.25 tells us, Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much more as you see the day approaching. So on 1025, there's a call to open, open church. Get back to church, because we need church. We need Jesus. I also heard a story this week about two brothers. They were notorious gangsters uh, named Guido and Mario. And Mario died, and his brother Guido asked the pastor to conduct the funeral service. And he said, uh, Guido tells the pastor that he would donate $100,000 to the building fund if at the funeral the pastor would tell all those in attendance that Mario was a saint. Well, the problem was, and the pastor paused and thought about it, because he knew Mario was a thief. A crime lord. He was in charge of all the drugs and prostitution in town. He knew he was an adulterer, possibly a murderer himself, but the church could sure use the money. So, after some time and some contemplation, the pastor agrees. And at the funeral, the pastor gets up and he says, Welcome. We have come to bury Mario. Many of you know him as the head of the local crime family, a drug lord in charge of prostitution and crime. But compared to his brother Guido, he's a saint. <laughs> he's a saint. If you would like to make your way to the book of Mark, we're going to be closing Mark chapter 12 this morning. You can follow along on the YouVersion app, um, on, the, uh, on the menu under the events page. Um, you should be able to find us there. And then all, my outline, all of the supporting verses, quotes, and you can add your own notes in there as well. I'm pretty sure I got it set up right this week. No technical difficulties there. But, um, so yeah, Mark 12. I'm going to pray to open us, and then we will begin. Lord Jesus, thank you for this morning. Thank you for your church. Lord, I pray over the church in America. And Lord, if there are any pastors out there who are Bible-believing ministers and preachers that do not have their churches open right now, I pray that you would convict their, their hearts, that um, they would be willing to listen to you and to heed the guiding of your Holy Spirit, that, that they would be faithful ministers of your word. There is something to be said, Lord, for online services and, and a way to view uh, church remotely, but that, that's not the way you designed your church. You designed your church to function as a body, that we could come together in fellowship, that we could encourage one another, and that we could in turn be encouraged by you in the gathering together under the just umbrella of your Holy Spirit and as you teach us. And so, Lord, I thank you for this church, for everyone who is faithful to come this morning, and for the body that you have assembled here at Calvary Laramie, for the blessing of each individual person, and yeah, just how the Holy Spirit is working in and through each one here at your church. Lord, I also want to lift up um, just... The continued fires, and thank you for this moisture and this winter storm, and I pray, Lord, that it would continue to go south and have an effect also on the fires in Colorado, and that you would also protect those mountain towns down there, um, specifically praying over Timberline Lodge in Winter Park and Ravencrest Chalet in um, Estes Park that are set up just as Bible schools and, and just tools and 
of, of ministry down there. And I just pray that you would just continue to provide for them and for their safety. And Lord, I also thank you for your word. And that is able to teach and lead and guide us and grow us. And uh, through it, we can follow you faithfully in application to our own lives and to our own hearts. And so I pray this morning that our hearts would be open to what the Holy Spirit has to teach us this morning. That your word uh, would not, not convict us. Maybe it does that, but that it would enable us to be obedient and faithful uh, children of, of God, children of the kingdom. So thank you for it. Thank you for teaching us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, in our study last week, we covered the subject of two contrasting themes or attitudes of pride and humility as we read through this record of Jesus surveying the hustle and bustle of the temple and the happenings therein. Uh, in this record, we see Jesus observing the attitude of the scribes. That We see in their description their robes, their conduct, and their actions. So the scribes would have been just... A portion of the religious leaders would have been to communicate the law to record the law and so and kind of a Something we learn about the scribes is that they like to go around in fancy robes and draw a lot of attention to themselves and we also see, so we see them as one group, and then this uh, poor widow who enters the temple on the contrasting end. And we see one is notab- noticeable in the crowd. Everyone, they would have stood out in a crowd, and then this uh, poor widow would have been more humble, maybe able to just fly under the radar. And going in and out of the temple, among the crowd, no one would even have been aware of her presence, but while everyone else noticing the scribes, or just going about their business, um, Jesus fixes his gaze on this woman. And he uses this moment as an opportunity, as he always does. One of the things that I've appreciated so much about going through the Gospel of Luke and, and really honing in Jesus' actions is he is always ready and always willing to use the situation as a, as, as a teaching opportunity for his, for his disciples to, to grow. And so he uses this opportunity to point out, hey, notice that widow over there and her offering. And he teaches, has, uses this opportunity, like I said, to teach a spiritual to his followers. We see in this contrasting comparison the value of humility and the downfall of pride. We read in 1 Peter uh, chapter 5 that God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. And we see that Jesus appreciates the heart and the inward attitude of this poor widow over the outward actions and the outward attitude of the scribes. This goes hand in hand as we looked at uh, David's summary in Psalm 51 where he declares, For you, O Lord, do not desire sacrifice or else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. These, O God, you will not despise. And God tells the prophet in, in 1 Samuel in 1 Samuel 15, as Sam is going out to select the new king of Israel, the Lord does not see as man sees, for man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. So we get an inward glimpse. Jesus is surveying, yeah, the, the outward goings-on and the outward appearance, but he's also able to go and take it on a deeper level and look at the heart. Now as we read this, the text that is before us this morning, it'll be a little bit of a review. But we can pick up on Jesus' supernatural ability to discern motive and the intents of the human heart. So it's with this thought in mind, we are going to be revisiting a portion of our study. But before we do, we're going to open with Psalm 24. Psalm 24 is just 10 verses long, pretty short chapter in the book of Psalms, but it's also going to complement our study looking at this theme of Christian giving or tithe. So Psalm 24 
It begins in verse 1, The earth is the Lord's and all its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord, or who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to an idol, nor sworn deceitfully, he shall receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is Jacob, the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face. Lift up your heads, O you gates, and be lifted up, you everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O you gates, lift up you everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. And coming back to our passage in Mark 12, it tells us now Jesus sat opposite the treasury and saw how the people put money into the treasury, and many who were rich put in much. Then one poor widow came and threw in two mites, which make a quadrant. So, and just to give you an idea of like what a quadrant, like the, I, I, I guess in, in my study this week, like there wasn't really a necessary like this is the equivalent to American money or American dollars, but kind of the best insight I got was in that day, it could buy you a roasted sparrow on a stick. It was about as much as you could get with, with two mites. So maybe, maybe a hot dog from the gas station, kind of equivalent, I don't know, type of thing. We'll go with that. But So he's, we see this widow. She comes, offers her two mites. So Jesus, in verse 33, so he called his disciples to himself and said to them, Assuredly, I say to you that this poor widow has put in more than all those who have given to the treasury, for they all put in out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, put in all that she had, her whole livelihood. As we begin our study this morning, I, I want to just give you a brief summary of where our discussion is headed. So we can all have a look at, at the map and understand where we're going. First, we'll take some quick notes and observation on those present. Looking at these people that Jesus is analyzing. Those who are wealthy and giving and, and also this poor widow who, who comes forward to also give. Second, we'll make a quick analysis on giving looking at some data and discussing the heart of giving. And then we'll look at the origins of giving, observing the Old Testament pattern, and then also the New Testament recommendation. And then to close, we'll come back to this poor widow, examine some healthy motives that should inspire our giving, and look to God as we are reminded of this ultimate provision, of His ultimate provision on our behalf. If you're here this morning and you're like, man, I thought... I was just coming here. I thought this might be a church. This might this church might be a little different because the churches I've been to, all they talk about is giving. And I will let you know, this will be the first sermon I've given in my four years behind the pulpit on the subject of giving. So if you're disappointed, come back next week. We'll talk about uh, the destruction of the end of the temple and some end of the world type of stuff, if that interests you. If you're like, man... I don't really want to hear about giving, but I am interested in the end of the world. Well, come back next week. We'll be opening up Mark chapter 13. Um, so yeah, it, it, Christian giving, get, how we give, the, the idea of tithing, it's, it's uh, I mean, it, it's how the, the church runs. It's how God funds his church. And it can be uncomfortable because as human beings, we have this idea that like, man, I have my things and I and I have my possessions and I own and like I make my money when in reality the the truth is is that it's all God's stuff and God's money and he just distributes it to us as he sees fit and then it's our privilege to offer back to him out of the abundance that he gives to us so that's kind of like the overall idea behind tithing, behind giving. And when it gets uncomfortable, I think, is when we have this false motives creep into our mind or f wrong ideas that this is all my stuff, when really it's not my stuff to begin with. 
So as we read this account, it can be easy to fall into a sense of disdain towards these, dis- these fellows or these people that are described as rich, while at the same time holding in high regard this widow that we also see who is pointed out to us. And I want to point out that there's actually nothing negative said about those who are described as, as wealthy or rich in this passage. And I want to encourage you in this, because jealousy or envy are not healthy attributes to put into practice in, in our daily lives. There is this very damaging mindset that is, has made its way into the hearts and mindsets of our culture these days. This kind of like classism or class warfare where there's people up here, the, the one percenters, right? And like they, they're so evil because they have all the money and then everybody else is down here. When in reality... What is it to us that God has blessed that person more than, like, like one of the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not envy. Like, who gives a care about somebody else's possession? Like, we shouldn't give a care about somebody else's possessions. And having this separation, this classism, to look on those more successful or more wealthy than we are and hold them in a negative light is the roots of socialism. Envy is the root of socialism. You are envious of those higher above you, and so you take actions then because you're like, ah, oh, man, like, I don't like that that person has more than I do. Then So then you're willing to then allow or implement, be a part of implementing strategies, governmental regulations that, that redistribute wealth. Like, that's how it goes. And... So just be aware, I want to point that out, nothing negative is said about these rich givers. They actually should be held in a positive light, and the text neither applauds nor condemns those who are rich in, in, and in their giving. So that, that's all I have to say on that subject. Nothing's negative said. Don't be like, oh man, these rich guys, like, poo-poo on them for giving a lot of money. Like, no, nothing's actually wrong with that. There's a difference between, and the reality of the text is that Jesus is pointing out a difference between giving out of abundance and giving all. So there's like this idea, and I was trying to come up with, with an analogy. The best thing I could think of is a glass of beer. Maybe we don't talk about that in church, but it's the best thing I could think of. So, like, you have a glass of beer that's poured to you, right? And, like, scraping the foam off the top, I would say that that's, like, giving in abundance. You take it off the top. You have a full glass, and you take off the top. All right, that's the abundance that God has given me. That's what I'm offering to the Lord. Versus having just, like, teeny tiny bit in your beer glass and, like, you're super thirsty, haven't had a drink in ages, yet you offer that to the Lord. And so maybe that makes sense to you, maybe not, but that's the best I could come up with. So there's a difference between giving out of abundance and giving all. And Proverbs 3, 9 through 10 says, Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase, so your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. But the widow... so. The rich aren't actually condemned for all the day, for giving out of abundance, but we do see that the widow is commended for giving all that she had. I heard a story this week about a chicken and a pig who were in the barnyard and they were discussing going into the breakfast business. And the chicken offers this idea to his friend the pig and he's like, hey, I was thinking about going into the breakfast business. Would you want to go in as like partners? And the pig's like, sure, what are you thinking? And he's like, I'm thinking about going into eggs and bacon business. And that should give you a chuckle because if you're going in and the pig is partnering with the chicken going into the eggs and bacon business, the chicken gives out of his abundance where the pig has to give up all he has. Right? So... Also, in preparation for this sermon, I decided to look into some spending habits of the United States. Um, in 2017, and 
there's, I was trying to find specifically like church giving. This was the best number I could come up with. But in 2017, tithers in the United States donated about $50 billion to churches. That's a lot of money. Comparing that to lottery and gambling expenditures from 2017, those numbers topped $220 billion. So it's an interesting thing to ponder where our hard-earned money gets distributed and what that says about us. In Matthew 6, 19-21, Jesus says, Do not lay for up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And on this subject, Gino Geraci asks, where does your treasure lie? And I think that this is a great question as Christians to analyze like where our focus is, where our priorities lie. Where does your treasure lie? In the fleeting, floating, futile riches of this world or in the faithfulness of God? Now, depending on how many people buy into the lottery and how many tickets and how high the lottery jackpot is at the time, you could have odds of winning um, at 1 in 300 million to win the lottery. Those aren't very good odds. And in looking at that, uh, just for perspective's sake, uh, and it's actually even less than that. I think the number I looked at was like 3.25 million. And again, it would probably depend on how high. Anyways. Just for perspective's sake, you're more likely to be mauled by a grizzly bear while on vacation at a national park than winning the jackpot lotto. Those odds are 1 in 2.7 million, according to the National Park Service. So, just so you know, if you're going out camping, you're going out exploring in the woods, buy a lottery ticket. Your chances are about the same. <laughs> uh, so, <clears throat> anyways... And, and so in, in analyzing that, that spending trend and thinking about it, I, I was like, man, isn't it crazy how our human minds can deceive us into putting more hope in the chance of hitting the lottery over the sure thing of our Heavenly Father's provision? Like, so willing to head over to the gas station, drop five bucks on a lotto ticket because you're telling me there's a chance. Right? And, but like, it's coming up on payday and I'm feeling a bit short on rent. Like, God's promise to provide for us. We'll, we'll get to it in Matthew chapter 6, uh, and where Jesus talks about, you know, clothing the lilies of the field. But 1 Peter 5 7 says, we can cast all our cares on Him because He cares for us. You have, we have a sure thing promised to us in the Father's provision. In Matthew 6, 25, Jesus says, Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow, nor reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. For your Heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow, has, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble." We can have confidence in giving unto the Lord, knowing that He has the ability to provide for us. The psalm we read, the opening line, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. 
and everything in it. It becomes an opportunity for us then to trust him and step out in the confidence of his provision. God, you got this. I know that you are able to provide for me. And so I am willing to offer to you that which you have already given to me. The widow in this passage had no idea where her next meal was coming from or if she would have an opportunity to earn more money soon, yet she was willing to give all she had because she had put her trust and confidence in God, that he is willing and able to provide for her needs. Now, where does this practice of giving or this practice of tithing originate? What does the Bible teach about tithing? Well, the word tithe simply means a tenth of something. If you're wondering where we get the idea of like 10% of our income or 10% of our possessions, that's what God kind of laid out as the outline of giving or the tithe. And from the very beginning of their inception, the Jewish people were instructed to a tithe to God. Leviticus 27 discusses tithes of the land, namely crops and livestock. And then Numbers 18 actually covers tithes of the financial nature, encouraging the people of Israel to give to the office of the Levites and provide for their aid and provision as they served in the house of the Lord, as they served in the temple. And we can trace this consistent pattern of giving throughout the Testament record and find that whenever Israel was in trouble, Oftentimes, it was tied to their tithe, and they're neglecting their offering for the Lord. One of the, if you want to like look into it specifically, in the book of Nehemiah, there's uh, as he reinstitutes, as he rebuilds Jerusalem, and they've reinstituted the the worship at the temple. They've rebuilt the temple. Jerusalem is rebuilt at this time. Nehemiah is overseeing all of it. He has to go back to while he's gone, there's kind of like a fallout that happens with the offering and the temple. And so then when Nehemiah gets back, he has to put everything back in order. And he's like, I, there's, he's like so upset about it because he's like, you, do you realize that this is kind of what's got us in trouble with the Lord in the first place? This is why our people were exiled from the land of promise to begin with. And here we are like falling back into this, like, what are you guys doing? We can't do this. So if you want to look into that, it'll be later on in the book of Nehemiah. I don't remember the passage exactly. I think like Nehemiah 12, 13 in that, in that area. But so there's a, a consistent line of tithe and, and the practice of that in the Old Testament. But as we tr transition into the New Testament, the obligation of the tithe is actually lifted. Now, before you say, like, sweet, I don't have to ever give money ever again. Sweet deal. Alistair Begg says, what does the Bible teach us about tithing? It teaches for us, firstly, that tithing was the basic pattern of giving in the Old Testament. It also teaches us, secondly, that tithing is not stated as an obligation in the New Testament. It is a pattern in the Old, but it is nowhere an obligation in the New. Now, even though the practice of tithing isn't explicitly stated... It doesn't mean that it's been done away with. Rather, it takes on a new model. The British pastor David Jackman observes the New Testament emphasis on generous giving militates against the idea of a percentage levy. Since, someone be, would, since some would be able to give far more than 10% and others for a time may not even be able to give that. The requirement has changed. And as we were talking about the Old and New Covenant and this age of grace we're now in, after the death of Christ, we're no longer obliged under the weight and instruction of the law to give a certain amount. Rather, we're encouraged to give out of, out of appreciation, generosity, and trust in God. And so there's this difference that happens. There's this change that takes place where now it's not an obligation, it's encouraged. It's not obliged, it's out of generosity. generosity. It's not required, but you're like called by God to like it, it and we'll we'll break it down. I believe we can see this motivation played out before us here in the text. Um Yes, yes, joyfully giving. 
Yes. 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 Yeah, and we'll break that idea. No, it's fine. No, joyful. Yeah. No, that's you're giving away the end of the sermon here. Anyway, no. Um, yeah. No. So uh, Jesus sat opposite the treasury and saw how the people put money into the treasury, and many who were rich put in much. Then one poor widow came and threw in two mites, which make a quadrant. So he called his disciples to himself and said to them, Assuredly, I say to you that this poor widow has put in more than all those who have given to the treasury. For they all put in out of their abundance, but she out of her poverty put in all that she had, her whole livelihood." As we read of this widow's actions through the description of Jesus, it's important to note the spiritual component at play in the analysis of giving. As Jesus is observing this poor woman's gift in comparison to wealth givers, he isn't saying that she is given more in quantity, like the quantity level, like in abundance, but on a percentage level. Not more in quantity, but more in percentage. David Guzik points out, Jesus did not say that she had put in more than any one of them. He said that she put in more than all of them, all of them put together. They all put in out of their abundance, but she out of her poverty put in all that she had. This explains how Jesus could say that the widow put in more than all. It was because all the others gave out of their abundance, but she gave sacrificially. And this comes to the idea that giving should cost us something. Giving should cost us something. In Samuel 24, we have this record of King David. And it said, Now Arana said to David, Let the Lord the king take and offer up whatever seems good to him. Look, here are oxen for burnt sacrifice and threshing implements and the yokes of the oxen for wood. All these, O king, Aruna has given to the king. And Aruna said to the king, May the Lord your God accept you. And then the king said to Aruna, No, but I will surely buy it from you for a price. Nor will I offer burnt offerings to the Lord my God with that which costs me nothing. So David bought the threshing floor and the oxen for 50 shekels of silver. Giving should cost us something. And it should cost us something because our relationship with God, our communion with God, our redemption cost God something. And we have set before us in the example of this poor widow the truth of this reality. She is willing to give all she had monetarily. Her giving did cost something. But on an even grander scale, we have the example of our Lord and Savior who is willing to give who was willing to give everything on our behalf. We referenced this passage last week, but it's worth bringing up again in Philippians chapter 2, 5 and 8, 5 through 8. It says, "Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant." And coming in the likeness of men, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death of the cross. And Romans three twenty four and 25 tells us that we are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood. It cost Jesus something. To redeem us. It cost him everything. He had to give up all that he had. His status in heaven. His, his abil- he, he, he gave up his godness. And that he could roam the earth and the heavens freely. And now he was constrained to a human body. Being in one place at one time. And then he was even constrained to the reality of being arrested and and put under trial, and then even the death of the cross. And so it cost Jesus something to redeem us. It cost him everything. And so Jesus paid the price he gave of his own volition on our behalf, offering himself for our salvation. And so 
with that example in mind, it, it should motivate our giving back to Him. Like, thank you, Lord, for the cost of, of yourself. And here's a small token of my appreciation out of what you've given me. Giving should cost us something because it costs Christ everything. Now to close our study this morning, I just want to highlight three motivations for giving that I think are able to summarize our study and give us something simple to go home with. Um, we haven't even had a chance to cover the ideas of how I should give, should it be monthly or weekly, uh, however you f see fit, or where should I give, should I give to my church, should I give to a charity, or how much should I give? Um, I believe all of these questions can be answered in your own conversations with the Lord. Pray, pray with Him about it. Lord, how are you giving? Do you want me to be taking money out of my paycheck every every? Do you want me to be giving every week? Do you want me to just be giving once a month? I think that God has given us liberty in that area to do with as He leads and guides us. And then, where you're giving. Um, just to give you a quick... Um, I don't know, just an idea on that. Um, Galatians 6.6 6 says, uh, Let him who is taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches. And so I think if we're going with that idea, you should be giving to your local church. Where are you being fed? Where are you being taught the word? That should be probably um, the priority place of your giving. And then from there, like, as you're led, let God distribute your provision wherever He sees fit. Wherever you're led, be faithful to follow the Lord in that way. I don't think that there's a hard and fast, this is how you should give, this is where you should give, and this is how much. That's between you and God. Pray about it. Ask Him. He will lead you in, in that way. It's His money. It's His provision in the first place. And I truly believe if you pray about it, and offer your finances to the Lord, ask where... He will lead and guide and direct you, and He will be faithful in that way. So, three motivations for giving. Attitude, respect, and source. There are three motivations for giving. Attitude, perspective, and source. First and foremost, our attitude should be a generous and joyful heart should be the defining characteristics of the Christian in our giving. 2 Corinthians 9 7 tells us, so let each one as give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. And David Guzik adds, Jesus' principle here shows us that before God, the spirit of giving determines the value of the gift more than the amount. God doesn't want grudgingly given money or guilt money. God loves the cheerful giver. If it's easy for you to give 5% of your income and you can give that willingly and joyfully, give that way. If, if it is if it gives you more joy and it helps you, like if you're happy to give to the Lord more than that, less than that, whatever. Give in a way that you are glad to give it to the Lord as your like sacrifice of praise. So our attitude should be with a joyful heart, not grudgingly, not Indian givers like, oh Lord, can I actually have that back? But just, just willingly. That's probably not a uh, politically uh, <laughs> appropriate. <laughs> Anyways. <clears throat> Very politically incorrect statement there, but whatever. <clears throat> Anyways, so number, number one, attitude. Give with a joyful heart. Number two, perspective. We should have an eternal and heavenward perspective behind our giving. Ultimately acknowledging like I said at the beginning, that our resources come from God. And believing that God can use our decisions and our resources here on earth to enact and affect heavenly results. 1 Corinthians uh, 10.31, Paul, Paul encourages us by saying, So whatever you eat, or whatever you do, whatever you eat, whatever you drink, or whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. 
And Gino Geraci observes, in order for you to truly believe that money can be used for God's glory, you must believe that God is the true owner of money and wealth. So as we give, we should have this eternal heavenward perspective that God, I believe that you are able to use my resources for your kingdom. And keeping that heavenward perspective because in reality and, and what Jesus in uh, the record of Luke where Jesus is riding in on um, Palm Sunday and all the people there are praising him and lifting up their hands and the religious leaders are kind of upset about it and they're like, hey, Jesus, would you tell all these people to be quiet? And Jesus tells them, actually, if these were quiet, the rocks would cry out. And so there's this idea that I kind of pick up in that text that like, God could use whatever means necessary to accomplish his kingdom on earth, yet he's given that privilege to us. Like, the church is his body. We have the privilege of being God's hands and feet on this earth and carrying out the work of his kingdom. That's a privilege. If we neglect it, he's going to start using the trees and the rocks and the boulders. And I think that that would be a lot... Uh, scarier, a lot more harsh to, to watch as God used that. We should be willing to be the resource for God's kingdom. So a, an eternal perspective, we should have an attitude of joy and an eternal perspective in our giving, and that leads to the motive for, motivation for giving. The final component is the source. The source of our giving. In her willingness to give all that she had, this poor widow in our study shows us what it looks like to know where our provision comes from. She likes to live by faith and put her trust in God, knowing that ultimately her resources both come from God and belong to God. If we look at it in this way, like we're just like a conduit for God's provision like like a dam on a river like it's just god's provision is coming up to us and it's going through us like comes up and goes through like we're just the the pass through element nothing's actually we don't actually do anything other than we're just available to be used and and pass it along like everything comes from god and to god and she is willing to acknowledge this truth of 24 1 that the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. So, God, I'm just giving it back to you because it's yours in the first place. And it's because of this fact that she can have confidence in giving, knowing that because God owns everything, He deserves access to everything. And because God owns everything, He too is capable of supplying for all of our needs. Um, a story that uh, not a story, record of Hudson Taylor. If you ever read Hudson Taylor's Spiritual Secret, um, and, and it's not the record of my son, Hudson Taylor, but the actual missionary who is his namesake. But there's a... a feel Like, over the process, it records Hudson Taylor's, like, heart and how God called him to be a missionary in China. And part of his motivation and how he got there was God showing him that he truly could provide for all of his needs. And so there's this part in, it, in, the, in his life where Hudson Taylor's like putting into practice relying on God for his provision. And this guy who he worked for was forgetful in, in paying him like his wage for his work. But Hudson Taylor decided that since God was truly the one who paid him and his boss was actually just like the conduit of that provision that he wasn't going to ever remind his boss that he needed paid. Rather, he would just pray that God would be the one to remind him. And so there was a point where it had been a week or two past where he owed rent on this place where he lived and was just coming up really short on funds. And so Hudson Taylor, like, still committed to praying, God, I know that you can provide for me. And uh, it ended up that, like, his boss either stopped by or caught him out the gate as he was leaving work that day, said, hey, I have forgotten, I've neglected to give this to you, and actually paid him out of, like, 
God's urging rather than Hudson Taylor actually remembering him, reminding him. So I think that that's a, a huge step of faith to put that much confidence in God. But it's probably where we should all be in terms of our confidence in God's provision, where it's coming from, and all of that jazz. So, And God in himself declares in Psalm 50 that he is the provider of all of our needs. He says in 50 verse 10, For every beast in the forest is mine, and the cattle on a thousand hills. I know all of the birds of the mountains and the wild beasts of the field are mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world is mine and all of his fullness. And so we can take solace in the fact that God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He is willing and able to provide for us all of our needs. Gino Geraci uh, says, This woman had elected to live life by faith. She would trust the Lord for her future. Didn't Jesus say, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these other things, food and clothing, would be provided? Your attitude about money and giving is linked to the issue of the heart. Will we trust the Lord? Trust is an expression of faith that God will, in fact, provide. The best way to give is to acknowledge the ability of the Lord to provide while also appreciate all that he has provided for us through the giving of his son. When when giving is done in this way, we're motivated out of gratitude rather than obligation and we're motivated out of knowing that God what you've given is yours and I'm just giving it all back to you. All of our giving, all of our um motivation should come out of an attitude of appreciation and trust that we can give by faith and give joyfully because God's given it. He deserves it. He's given us more than we deserve. And so it's from that attitude that we give to him. And that is where we'll close. Jesus, thank you for this morning. Thank you for your word and for this gift of giving that we have a small privilege of being uh, conduits of your kingdom here on earth. That, God, you use and you distribute your um, provision in and through your church. And so I ask, Lord, that we would be cheerful givers, that you would fill our hearts with joy at the idea that this is just a, a small um, token of our appreciation for everything that you've given us. Because the reality of Overcoming sin and death on our behalf and offering us grace is way, um, way more valuable than our monetary or physical gifts and offerings to you. So I just pray over this church, Lord, that you would continue to bless it and that we would be faithful distributors of the provision that you give to us. And Lord, also that, um, I could be a, a cheerful and joyful giver to your kingdom. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you please stand?